The year is 1793. The French monarchy has been toppled, and flames of revolution continue to scorch France. In a cold, desolate cell, Marie Antoinette, the once adored and now reviled queen, awaits her death. On the morning of her execution, she awakens at approximately 6 a.m. and is made to change into a plain white gown, a stark contrast to the lavish attire she was once known for. Unlike Louis XVI, who was granted the privacy of a closed carriage on his final journey, Marie Antoinette will be taken to her execution in an open cart, exposed to the jeers of the crowd. She protests this indignity, but her pleas are ignored. The Sansom family, the hereditary executioners for the French crown, are called upon to perform their most infamous task. Henri Sansom, assistant executioner and son of the royal executioner, Charles Henri Sansom, records the harrowing events as follows. We entered the prison and were taken to the Queen's presence. She was in the Hall of the Dead, reclining on a seat with her head against the wall. The two gendarmes who watched her stood a few steps away, along with the jailer, whose daughter stood before the queen weeping bitterly. When we entered, the queen rose and took a step to meet us, but she was intercepted by the jailer's daughter, whom she embraced with much tenderness. She wore a white dress with a white handkerchief draped over her shoulders, and her hair was covered by a cap tied with a black ribbon. She was pale, but not from fear, for her lips were red and her eyes shone brightly. We removed our hats and many others bowed, Napier the usher and a few gendarmes were the only ones who did not offer this small sign of respect. Before anyone had time to speak, the Queen stepped forward and said in a steady voice, Gentlemen, I am ready. My father noted that a few formalities remained to be completed. She presented the back of her neck where her hair had been cut for him to examine. At the same time, she held out her hands for him to bind them. While my father was thus occupied, the abbot entered the room and asked her permission to accompany her. The abbot, who had sworn an oath of loyalty to the Republic, had already offered his services, but they had been declined. His repeated requests visibly displeased the Queen, yet she nonetheless agreed to have him accompany her. The procession immediately moved forward. The gendarmes preceded the Queen, who was accompanied by the abbot. Behind them came the clerk, my father, and more gendarmes. Upon reaching the courtyard, Marie Antoinette saw the cart. She came to a sudden stop, and a strong feeling of horror appeared on her face. However, she quickly mastered her emotions and was helped up by my father. The gates slowly opened, and the Queen of France appeared before the people. There was an immense clamor of curses and cries of death to the Austrian, death to Madame Vito. The crowd was so dense that the cart could barely move, and the horse reared and backed. At two different points, men broke through the ranks of the escort, and instead of driving them back or trying to calm the popular unrest, the gendarmes joined in their shouts. In a shocking display of disrespect, an army officer had the cowardice to threaten the Queen's face with his clenched fist. The abbot pushed him back and rebuked him for his disgraceful behavior. This scene lasted two or three minutes. My father told me that Marie Antoinette never appeared more dignified than she did in that moment. Another officer went forward with a few horsemen and cleared the way. From time to time, the cries and curses partially subsided, though a few shouts of death to the Austrian still rose from the crowd but these exclamations became increasingly rare. The queen stood erect in the cart. The abbot spoke to her, but she did not answer and did not even seem to hear him. When they passed the Palais Égalité, she began to show some uneasiness, looking at the house numbers with more than ordinary curiosity. She had foreseen that no priest of her faith would be allowed to accompany her. A prescribed ecclesiastic with whom she had communicated had promised to be in a house on the Rue Saint-Honoré on the day of the execution and to give her absolution in extremis. The number of the house had been given to Marie Antoinette, and that was what she was searching for. She found it 
And then, with a sign that only she understood, having recognized the priest, she bowed her head and prayed. After this, she breathed more freely and a smile touched her lips. Upon reaching the destination, the cart stopped directly opposite the large walkway of the Tuileries. For a few moments, the queen was lost in painful contemplation. Her color faded, her eyelids trembled, and she was heard to murmur, my daughter, my children. The sight of the scaffold brought her back to her senses and she prepared to descend. As she placed her foot on the ground, my father, who was bending towards her, said in her ear, have courage, madam. The queen looked around as if surprised to find pity in the heart of the man about to execute her and answered, thank you, sir, thank you. A few yards separated the cart from the guillotine. She advanced slowly, but with a firm step, ascending the scaffold as majestically as if the steps of the guillotine were the grand staircase at Versailles. Her arrival on the platform caused some confusion. The abbot who had followed her continued his futile exhortations, but my father pushed him aside, wanting to complete the execution without a moment's delay. We took hold of the queen. While we were tying her to the plank, she exclaimed in a loud voice, Farewell, my children. I'm going to join your father. The plank was returned to its original position, and the knife fell heavily upon her neck. A few cries of Vive la République were heard around the scaffold, and we were ordered to display the head to the people. After the blade fell, the queen's head was shown to the roaring crowd. The body of the once reviled Austrian she-wolf was placed in an unmarked grave in the cemetery of the Church of Madeleine in Paris. A popular legend claims that during the gravedigger's lunch break, Marie Groholtz, later known as Madame Tussaud, made a wax imprint of Marie Antoinette's face. While this story has been widely circulated, there is no historical evidence to support it. Decades later, in 1815, Louis XVI's younger brother exhumed Marie Antoinette's remains and gave her a proper burial at the Basilica of Saint-Denis. All that remained of her, besides her bones and some of her white hair, were two garters in mint condition. Whether royalist or revolutionary, one cannot deny that Marie Antoinette faced her fate with unwavering dignity, regal in every sense of the word.